So um, we'll hand over to you, Millie. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Um, hello. Where am I? Woodley. Woodley. I was going to say Reading. I realised that was an error. Um, OK. Um, thank you very much for inviting me, and thank you all for being here. This is amazing. What a fantastic turnout. Um, so, I've been asked to come and talk to you this evening about a project called the B-Roads, um, which is... It came out of uh, Transition Marlborough. So, are, are people familiar with the Transition Network? And a few nods in the room. Um, so it's, it's now a global uh, network of communities who are coming together to really try to create a more sustainable uh, future for ourselves, actually. Um, and communities are doing that in lots of different ways. Um, and we're really just doing what we can with what we have um, in, our, in our own places. So in Marlborough, this, was, this is one of the ways that we're uh, implementing transition, really, and, and looking at becoming a bit more future fit. So what I'm going to do in the presentation... Uh, is um, oh I chair transition that's kind of yeah my connection with it now um, so what I'm going to do is just tell you a bit about this project how we began uh, and and what we're currently doing locally some of that is community led and some of it very fortunately for us is led by a group of farmers on the Marlborough Downs um, so again when we our hope is that this project is replicable in different places and I think in different places it will look different because the resources available to you uh, will be different but I do want to tell you a bit about that farmers project um, that farmers group on the downs because they're doing some tremendous things and they too created a model which has then been replicated nationally so I'm hoping that the B roads will will will, will follow uh, in that in that vein um, so I'll tell you a bit about our vision for what replication looks like. It's now changed, actually, from when we first began. I think we were, um, we were quite small in our vision, and now Reading and Woodley and other areas wasn't included in the beginning. I just wanted to do Wiltshire, but I think, you know, we can just get big. Just get big. Um, so, and, a, and an idea of the scale of what is required um, if we are really going to help bees and other pollinators, and in fact all insect life really um, the scale is quite big and it is important that as many of us as possible step up to the plate to do something <coughs> about that um, and then I will say something about how this links to the bigger picture of, of policy and other national projects uh, because we're certainly not doing this by ourselves okay so this is this is Rob Hopkins this is how happy people are when they are involved with the transition. <laughs> Rob always looks this happy every time I've ever seen a photograph or a film of this man. He is always this happy. Um, and he described <laughs> transition as a movement of communities coming together to reimagine and rebuild our world. And I think that the B Roads is actually quite a good representation of that. This is another inspiring man. This is Colin Tudge. Some of you may know Colin um, or know of him. He is a biologist and an author and a naturalist, and he was also one of the founding members of the Oxford Real Farming Conference. Um, and we were very fortunate, myself and one of the farmers involved in this project, to present at the Oxford Real Farming Conference about this project um, back in January. And one of the most important things, uh, one of his lovely quotes... Um, this is Colin. This is kind of his reason for being, really. He wants to live in a convivial society within a flourishing biosphere. And I just want to go, yes, Colin, so do I. And I hope that everyone here kind of shares that thought, really. Um, and we can't have a flourishing biosphere if we don't have insect life, if we don't have pollinators. And actually, we don't have a convivial society because... We don't have a lot of food if we don't have pollinating insects. So these things, a convivial society in a flourishing biosphere is absolutely crucially dependent on flying insects and pollinators. Um, mm, except there aren't as many as there used to be. So this is a little bit of a hazy picture, but some of you will, in the room will be old enough to remember when streetlights had a big cloud of moths around them at night. Some of you will be able to remember that if you left your bedroom windows open at night and the light on, you'd wake up with moths in your mouth and stuck in your hair. 
Some of you will remember that if you drove down on a summer's afternoon um, for a nice afternoon drive, you'd have to stop en route to scrape the windscreen off. Yeah? In fact, there were special um, cleaning agents that you could buy in every service station to help you do that. Well, they don't sell them anymore because we don't need them. And we don't need them because the insects are largely gone. So it's really important that we do something about this um, because actually the situation is, um, is really quite dire, actually. <laughs> the last year there was a piece of research that was done in Germany and what they found was, OK, this is the bleak bit, it gets better. All right. OK, but it's important that we set the scene. So this was, this was research that was published in Germany beginning of last year, I think. And what they found was over a 27-year period, um, they, what they were doing was catching insects um, and they were measuring the biomass. So they weren't looking at individual species. They weren't looking at kind of particular sorts of bees or flies or hoverflies. They were simply en masse catching insects in, in the same place at the same time for 27 years and they were simply weighing the biomass. And what they found over that time was a 75% decline. In fact, in the peak of summer, that decline was about 82%. <laughs> it's huge. It's almost too big for us to, for us to contemplate. Um, and also bearing in mind, that this, this started in 1989. Now, 1989 wasn't, probably wasn't a year of, of enormous abundance either. There had already been a decline um, in, in insect populations prior to the beginning of that research. Um, but this is just kind of, this is, as I say, setting the scene. Then we know, uh, so those of you who have seen the Blue Planet series, for instance, we have a better understanding now of the oceans um, and what's going on there. And we know that krill and phytoplankton um, in the oceans are they're, they're, they're the, the, the roots of this, this whole big complex food system. And this is a good analogy for us because flying insects are essentially the krill and plankton of a really complex food system on land. They, they are the equivalent. So in the same way that this collapses without krill and phytoplankton, the, 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 the system on land collapses without insect life. Um, and we have forgotten what abundance looks like. So this is a thing called shifting baseline syndrome. Um, it was quite a few years ago now, uh, this um, chap, Dr. Daniel Pauley, he was looking at... Um, uh, how we perceive abundance, basically, and how we, we base it on our lived experience. So if I think about the, my, let's think about my 19-year-old niece, for instance, her lived experience of what abundance looks like in the natural world is really, really different to what my grandmothers or my great-grandmothers would have been. So in living memory, that, that um, idea of what abundance looks like and what is normal for us has, has changed rapidly. And that's part of the reason why we haven't really noticed this crisis sort of creep up on us, um, because we've normalised we've normalized change. And, uh, yeah, so this is... And it has a name, and it's called shifting baseline syndrome. Um, so it is a bit, of a, a bit of a concern. It's more than a bit of a concern. So the, the beginning of this project started uh, back in... Back sort of 2016, actually... We watched a film called The Vanishing of the Bees. Now, when we saw that in 2016, it, it actually had already been out for quite a while, that film. And it was very much based on the American experience of colony collapse disorder in honeybees. It was, that was a, a, a very specific thing. It didn't really become such a big issue in this country. But what we did learn from that film uh, was, uh, were uh, a number of things that, that was relevant here and uh, was relevant to our bee and pollinator population. Because the things that were affecting those bees in the States were, were also happening here. So this, this cluster of things all happening together, that we have this loss of diversity and quantity in year-round pollen and nectar-rich flowers. So we often think about the summertime and our gardens being full of lovely flowers and full of bees. But actually they need those pollen and nectar-rich flowers uh, from around sort of late January, early February, right through to the first frosts. It's not just that kind of, not, not just that summer peak. 
that there was a lot of habitat for nesting and hibernation. This isn't just about food. It's about how they, how they raise their young um, and, and larval stages of, of other insects. Pesticide use, fragmentation of habitat, and that's essentially what the Bee Roads Project is about, is about uh, addressing that uh, problem of fragmentation. Um, climate change, as... Uh, as the temperature rises, then the areas that uh, insects habit, um, inhabit, they have to move to, and often they're moving north. Now their food sources, bees can, bees can move quite quickly, flying insects, birds, things that fly, things that run, can move quite quickly, but their plant food sources don't move as quickly with them. So that's part of this problem. And then of course we have diseases and parasites. Now if you're quite a fit bee or hoverfly or whatever you might be, um, then you might be able to fight off disease and, and parasites. However, if all of these other things um, have weakened your resource, um, then these things become really troublesome. So we learnt about this and we also learnt that honeybees in particular will travel somewhere between three or four miles to get food if forage isn't kind of on their doorstep. That seemed an extraordinary uh, distance for these tiny things to fly, three or four miles. So we're watching this film and we were in Marlborough and we had friends there from another group called uh, the Pusey Environmental Action Team. And Pusey is about seven miles away from us. And we thought, oh, okay, so if, if bees travel about three or four miles, then our Marlborough bees and the Pusey bees are probably hanging around somewhere in the middle, around Clench Common. That won't mean anything to you. Um, but it's about halfway between Marlborough and Pusey. Um, and we thought, well, we've already got an A road between these two places. What if we had a B road? OK, so we cogitated on that for a while. <laughs> it takes a while um, to, uh, often for projects to come to fruition. You, um, any of you involved with community things will probably be very conscious of that. So it took a while, and we thought about it, and we thought about it. Anyway, we, we, we started getting things together, um, and eventually we did have a meeting, and we, and we got a map out, and we just penciled it in. There we go. Well, let's just draw a space on this map. So there's Marlborough at the top. There's Marlborough. Um, and there's Pusey. And there's, there's, there's Kench Common <laughs> in the middle, where our bees are hanging out together. Um, and we thought, let's just see if we can join it up. Let's just give it a go. Let's see who is in this space. Who do we know? And of course, we know everybody. Because when you live some, when you're kind of seven miles away from something, well, that's not just a bee friendly space, that's a human friendly space. We know between us, a group of us, we know everyone. And if we don't know them, then we know somebody who does. So this becomes possible to join up a space of, of, of this size um, on a map, really. So, of course, uh, we, we got the map out, we drew a shape, um, and then and we had a banner. You have to have a banner, don't you, for a project? Okay. So this, this was our banner, um, and this is... There are a number of these uh, up at the beginning and end of the roads. And the idea behind the images here was that each of these flowers represents a month of the year where we need uh, some flowers. So we've so snowdrops and um, goat willow and apple blossom and honeysuckle and so on. So this is the flower year, if you like, uh, as part of that. So the, the four main aims of this project, as we started to develop it a bit, uh, was one, to raise awareness of what was happening to bees and other pollinators. We just want more people to know what the problem is. So how can we do something about it if we don't know what the issue is? So to raise awareness, and then to encourage as many people as possible to contribute at whatever level they can contribute. Do what you can with what you have now here, basically, um, to join this landscape up uh, between, uh, between Marlborough and Pusey. And then to actively contribute to national citizen science. So there's a lot out there, and I'll talk a bit more about that nearer the end. There are ways, it's very important that we know the impact of what we're doing. So, and there's also no point in reinventing the wheel. So there are national monitoring schemes that all of us can contribute to, and there are national data sets uh, that um, can tell a lot about uh, insect populations uh, and their geographic spread. And then the fourth thing was hopefully to create a replicable model of an effective community-based response to the national pollinator strategy. Um, so I'm guessing that we're, we're kind of doing something right because 
I'm here. Um, so <laughs> hopefully this will be a replicable thing. So this is what we want people to know. We want people to know uh, about the problems that bees are facing. So since uh, in the post-war period, we've lost 97% of our wildflower meadows in this country. They are almost completely eradicated now. Um, and this is key food source for pollinating insects. 300,000 kilometres of hedgerows also lost since the war. Now, some of that has been replaced. Some tens of thousands of kilometres have been replaced. If you can't picture that, 300,000 kilometres seems like an awful long distance. It's 280 times Land's End to John O'Groats. Okay? That's how long 300,000 kilometres is. So you start to get a feel for what has been lost in our landscape. Um, much of our farm landscape actually is pretty, it's just industrial. It's pretty industrial. 80% um, of our chalk downlands lost in the past 60 years. And chalk downland is, is very dear to our heart in Wiltshire because we have some bits of what's left, <laughs> which is very precious. Um, and we've, we've already lost three species of bumblebees. We've got there are 25 species of bumblebees and over 250 species of other solitary bees. Um, and so let alone all the hoverflies and all the other things. But we've lost three of them already. Ten are currently severely threatened and we might lose another two in the next five to ten years. So this is um, important stuff. And many of those species of solitary bees um, are under threat. But actually, we don't know a great deal about them. There was something in the pollinator strategy about how much we actually don't know what the baseline is for many of these species. So we don't even know what we're losing. Uh, it's kind of tragic, actually. It's quite heartbreaking. So this idea of wildflower meadows being lost and the bees and the other insects not having anything to eat, we too have lost something phenomenal in our landscape because this is beautiful. We have lost this too. We're not seeing this um, in, in our landscape anymore. These astonishing fields of jewels are also not making our hearts sing anymore because so our landscape um, also doesn't look as beautiful as it used to. So these, of course, are our corn poppies and um, corn cockles. And uh, so these are the rude rules. They go out and they, they seed in uh, newly, newly ploughed soil. Um, but of course, actually, lots of bees and other pollinators need perennial things. So this is clover-rich, um, clover-rich meadow, which is really beautiful. So yeah, what we do for bees, we do for people. We need to bear that in mind. And of course, without pollination, we haven't got a lot of food, <laughs> unfortunately. And it's the interesting food that is pollinated by insects. It's the stuff that makes our diet more exciting. Uh, so about one in three of the calories that we eat come from insect pollinated food. That's quite a big chunk. The other two thirds is um, um, wind pollinated or, um, or isn't vegetative. And three quarters of the fruit and veg that we eat. So it's the interesting things and the things that give us all our um, uh, extra nutrients and vitamins and so on. Um, and uh, we, not currently in this country, but this is a thing in the world, hand pollination of fruit trees by people. This is happening now in, in China because there aren't enough pollinating insects. People are literally climbing trees with tiny paintbrushes and pollinating fruit trees. Unbelievable. And people have made robotic bees, to, oh Lord, um, to pollinate plants that are growing in greenhouses just in case we lose all our pollinators. I kind of wish that all that research and development could have been redirected to stop the bees dying, possibly. Anyway, <clears throat> oh, off my soapbox for a moment. So, um, so they're important. They're really important. And then here we are. This is the pollinator strategy, national pollinator strategy, 10-year thing, uh, which was um, published in 2014. And these are quotes from that strategy. We have a limited understanding of the abundance of other pollinator species. And what they mean by that is other than bumblebees. Uh, other than honeybees, essentially. Um, so such as bumblebees and hoverflies and how they're changing. This was the national pollinator strategy basically stating we don't know what's out there. Um, in particular, we don't know exactly how many of these other species we have now or how many we had in the past. Oh, God. 
It's very hard to measure progress when you haven't got a baseline. Um, so the pollinator strategy actually said that the first half of that strategy was going to be about trying to, to discern um, that baseline a little bit more clearly. It is therefore difficult to be precise about the rates of change or what are the underlying causes. That's, that's, quite, that's quite tough. But going back to that slide at the beginning uh, of streetlights covered in moths, we can see out there that change has happened and actually we can see when improvements occur because you'll be closing your windows at night with the lights off, um, um, hopefully in the future. So this is, these are some of the things that we're doing on the project in, in Marlborough uh, and like I say, we're trying to encourage as many people to be involved in this as possible in as many different ways um, as they choose to do so. So some of it is, uh, and I'll talk about the, about the farmers in a moment, uh, so field margins, wilder seeded field margins, uh, looking very differently at you know, kind of how big landscape is being managed, uh, encouraging people to reduce their pesticide use, whether they're landowners or gardeners with a, with a window box. Um, uh, as I said before, taking part in national monitoring, uh, adding our data to that big data set to help to improve that, uh, that baseline. Anything that's um, arts and crafts and music. Uh, we had the, the Bees Knees Kaylee as one of our um, big fundraisers <coughs> for the project. Um, so we like a bit of music and we like a bit of, a bit of art and craft to keep people going. Neighbourly sharing of plants and seeds, literally people who've got bee-friendly gardens just pop stuff up, grow on some seeds, literally give them to your neighbours and encourage your neighbours to, to, you know, kind of be uh, more bee-friendly in their gardens. Uh, we've got a number of schools involved and they're starting to introduce that into their cross-curricular learning, particularly primary schools. They're much more uh, open, I think, to, um, to that kind of introduction. And then we, and I'll show you some pictures in a moment of, we did a, a, a big communal autumn bulb planting um, scheme. And we want, to, we want people to understand that diversity is really, really important. This is not just about honeybees. It's actually not just about bees. <laughs> it's about all pollinators. But the bees are quite a good poster girl, really, I think, for these kind of things. And the bee rose has a bit, of a, um, <laughs> a bit of a ring to it. So it's really important that we have different bees doing different things. So apple blossom, for instance... Actually, red mason bees do most of the pollinating for, um, for apples. They do about 60 to 100 times more pollination than honeybees do. And we don't know much about red mason bees. Some people haven't even heard of them. Uh, but they're much, much more effective pollinators uh, than honeybees are. And most of our tree fruit is actually pollinated by um, uh, by them. So these sorts of plants, so this is um, like bean plants that have those long flowers. Well, they need bees with long tongues. Because short-tongued bees, um, they just nibble a little hole in the top here and they steal the nectar, but they don't do the pollinating. Uh, so any of you who have comfrey in your garden, you'll see the same thing happen. Watch bees in comfrey flowers. The long-tongued the long bees will go into the flower and the short-tongued bees will just make a little hole at the top and suck the nectar out. It's awesome. It's lovely to watch. Um, your tomatoes have to have bumblebees because they need to be, the flowers actually need to be shaken to get the pollen out of them and the bumblebees literally buzz, uh, uh, buzz pollinate them. Uh, so other bees aren't as effective uh, for pollinating those. And things like strawberries uh, actually need, this is a hoverfly, they need different, a, a quite a wide variety of things to, um, to pollinate them to get a good crop. And of course they're not just pollinating stuff for us to eat, they're also pollinating things like clover uh, which is um, uh, nitrogen fixing, it's improving soil, it's also obviously fodder for um, uh, various animals. Um, in the landscape around here, do you see rapeseed fields? Yes, quite a lot at this time of year. We've got a lot of them in the Red Wilbur. And when, in fact actually, I used, to, I used to think that rapeseed was really awesome for bees and they really loved it. But actually we were down, where were we? Down near Salisbury. Um, a few weeks ago, past a rapeseed um, field, and we stopped, and I walked into the field, and I didn't hear a single bee. The whole field. I couldn't see one, I couldn't hear one. I thought that was a little bit odd, because this is like 
it's literally nectar, um, which is intriguing. But what happens in our landscape is often this kind of feast and famine thing. So it comes and then it, it all, it's all harvested or it all um, goes over at the same time. And also my, uh, my beekeeping friends tell me that if bees only eat rapeseed um, to make their honey, uh, they actually have a problem getting it out of the, um, out of the hives because it, it, it's this kind of uh, really thick white honey. It's, it's quite a specific thing uh, depending on um, what, the, what the bees have eaten. Um, and there was, of course, a, a big thing about... Uh, Neonicotinoid pesticides, yeah, they, were, they were banned because they were uh, allegedly affecting bees and there was a concern that that would mean that the, uh, the crops would be reduced. It turns out that they weren't really, they weren't, the, the, the crops weren't um, particularly affected by that ban. And one of the reasons might be, this, is, this was quite an interesting piece of research that was done around a very similar plant, this is a field mustard, it's very similar to rapeseed. And this piece of research was looking at pollinating these plants either with bumblebees or with hoverflies, okay? And in just nine generations of these plants, the ones that were pollinated by bumblebees were three inches taller, they flowered earlier, they smelt stronger, and they had much stronger bee-friendly colours. So bees, particularly bumblebees, don't just pollinate anything. They choose the plants that they pollinate, and they are then part of the picture of improving genetic diversity in the plants that we have. And we need genetic diversity, particularly in our food plants, if we're going to be surviving what's coming in terms of climate change. Um, so if we don't have the diversity of pollinating insects, that has an impact on the diversity of the plants that they're, they, they help to create the plants that they're pollinating. Um, and of course, they are pollinating, so this is uh, um, hawthorn, um, which is food for so many wild species. And it isn't just that they're useful, they're just brilliant. There was this, this was, I found this little, I, I'm not, this is a still, it's not, it's not the video. But this was an experiment that was done with bumblebees. This is so awesome. Um, these, this is a bumblebee here. And these little dishes had a little drop of uh, nectar-rich fluid on them. And over the top of them uh, was, was this sheet of plastic. So the bees couldn't come and land on these things. A hundred bumblebees were put into this experiment. And two of them, two of them learnt how to pull these little pieces of string to bring this out from under the cover so they could drink the fluid. Not only did those two bees learn how to do that, they went back to their mates and they taught them how to do it. <laughs> bees are tremendous. They are simply of value just because they're bees. And they are um, really, really awesome creatures. So here are some of the things that, that we have done, and this is kind of a bit of a range of things. So one of the things, um, in our village, we have a flower and vegetable show, uh, and I managed to persuade the organiser to add a category uh, to the show, which was bee-friendly flowers, a vase of bee-friendly flowers. It might, that might seem like quite a small thing, but we had quite a lot of entries. There was a lot of discussion uh, about what kind of plants were in these vases. They looked absolutely beautiful, and I'd just like to say that was my first prize. <laughs> I would have been really embarrassed had I not won at least third in that competition. Um, but this is, kind of, is the, this is at the beginning of September, and um, you know, we can find a lot of variety in our gardens that are, are bee-friendly. This is a... Um, artichoke that I just let go to flower. They're so beautiful. Uh, little crocheted bees. Okay, so we can hand these out at um, <laughs> fates or events. Uh, we, uh, the beekeepers in the village, one, my friend Louise, who's a beekeeper, um, has had one of these dangling from her thatch for the last two years. This is the bee house. Um, uh, we had... Uh, some of these uh, stones painted, yeah, so people can find them and hide them and then come back and find us online and stuff like that. Um, and this is a stand of free plants for bees. Uh, the donations from this stand have gone to help build a new bee garden at our village hall. 
Uh, so it's kind of, and, and once those plants are established, we'll propagate from those plants to feed the stall, to feed the garden. So it will kind of be cyclical. These were Verbena bonariensis. For any of you uh, who are familiar with, um, with these plants, they're wonderful things. They grow about they're kind of this tall, beautiful little clusters of purple flowers on the top, absolutely loved by bees and butterflies. And I was asked to weed someone's drive. Oh, they're not weeds. They're Verbena bonariensis. So I dutifully filled my lunchbox with seedlings and I potted them all up. And I had about 70, all told, and they grew on beautifully and raised quite a lot of money for our garden in the process. Uh, so, yeah, so some of the things that we're doing. And these are some, just some of the people who have been involved. Uh, so we've, got, we've had primary schools, we've got other local organisations like the Action for the River Kennet, um, parish councils, uh, the Wildlife Trust, um, uh, local uh, radio stations, uh, local businesses. So my apple juice, this is a, a chap who... Uh, takes people's apples and he presses them and, and, and bottles them and pasteurises them and you have your own labels on them and things. It is of course in his interest that there are bees because without the bees there will be, he has no business. Uh, so, um, uh, and the Baylor Pusey Church's team, so they're looking at uh, increase in improving the wildlife friendliness of their churchyards. So we've got lots of, lots of people involved. And then we were really, really fortunate to have the Marlborough Downs Space for Nature project. Um, so, uh, so here we are with our little map of Marlborough to Pusey. Uh, but then I was introduced to this marvellous woman, Dr Gemma Batten, who manages that project on the Marlborough Downs. Um, she also is this enthusiastic all the time. It's, uh, okay. So she cottoned on to this idea and she said, oh... Oh, hang on, hang on, we, we, we've got 42 farmers who have um, allied themselves to join up their landscape on the Marlborough Downs. We've already done marvellous things for wildlife. We need a new challenge. Let's, let's take on the bee roads. So within a very short space of time, we then suddenly had another three bee roads. So this is Marlborough as a hub, um, but that <coughs> area across the Marlborough Downs goes out to Avebury, to Broadhinton, and up towards Swindon, um, to, to, Ch to Chiseldon. And they embraced the project. I just went, cool. Mm. Mm. Do we see a pattern emerging? Yes. <laughs> yes, look what happens when we have a hub somewhere and people just kind of move out from there. Petals become flowers and then we start to, uh, uh, to fill up landscape, really. So that's quite exciting, really. Uh, so we, uh, we got a new logo to represent that, there we are. And I just want to say something about how this logo was created. There's a lovely young man, James Osborne, who is an artist and he lives in Swindon. And we got in contact with him and he, and he said that he'd help us to, uh, to create a logo for the, for the project. And for various reasons, it wasn't possible for us to pay him, f financially pay him for his time. Um, I said, so well, we, we need to recompense you in some way. And he said, um, maybe I really like drawing flowers. So we paid him in flowers. And once a month, for I think six months, a bouquet arrived on his doorstep. Um, and that seemed like an appropriate way to pay someone who was going to help bees and flowers, actually. So we paid him in flowers um, for, his, for his work. So this Space for Nature project, this is a map of England, and these yellow areas are these nature improvement areas. Okay, they were, it, was a, it was a government uh, project about seven, eight years ago. So this is the Marlborough Downs one. This is us, Marlborough Downs here. Um, this was the nature improvement area. And it's well worth having a look at their website. So it's spacefornature.net, uh, and it's... It's just an amazing thing. One of the first things that they did as part of this project, this joining up of the landscape, was to put water back onto chalk downland. So there used to be dew ponds up on the downs, and many of them were filled in or levelled. So chalk downland doesn't hold water. It's really, really dry up on those hills. So one of the first things they did was put 16 dew ponds back onto the Marlborough Downs, and now 80% of that landscape is within a mile of water. 
and it is phenomenal. They have, they, some of them have fish in them. <laughs> um, I guess the fish eggs come on the birds, of, uh, on birds feet and so on. Um, but hopefully you saw a little bit of a, a, a slideshow there. We, one of the farmers, David White, is, a, is an absolutely tremendous photographer and captures so much of what they've created um, out there on the downs. And it is truly a space of nature. So they'd already done some amazing work with tree sparrows. They created sparrow villages. Uh, so again, using uh, everyone uh, involved in that project, contributing something on their land and understanding that it's, it's the joining up that's important if we're actually going to help um, uh, wildlife. So now, these farmer clusters, that their model for managing landscape on that level has now been replicated around the country. So what they did on the Marlborough Downs has now been replicated everywhere. And there is a bit of me that um, I want at some point to be able to be looking at a map like that, saying, so the B Road started in Marlborough and now they're everywhere. <laughs> Um, I think that could happen. So, so, so because of that involvement with the farmers, uh, we, we got some more banners printed, <laughs> like you do. So going out um, in different directions from Marlborough. Uh, and they are out and about. Here's one. There's one of our banners, and that's Silbury Hill um, in, the, in the background there. So this is the, 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 the A4. Um, so uh, Avebury Stone Circle is up here. And that's Avebury. That actually doesn't look very bee-friendly at this point, does it, to be honest, with that, with that, with that bare field. Um, but they were some of the farmers who were involved. And uh, so they very kindly offered us uh, website space and so on, and uh, that was the beginning of, of us having some uh, online, online presence also. So some of the things that they were doing, this project isn't just about always starting something new, it's also about recognising what we're already doing. And one of the things that they were already doing on the downs was, was growing sunflowers. And they were growing sunflowers for bird seed, so they can feed their own tree sparrows, so they grow their own bird food, essentially. What this woman here is doing is recording the sunflowers because they, the, the buzz from the insects that were on them was so loud, it was worthy of going on the radio. <laughs> so she is, she's, she's recording recording the bees, but just like sunflowers as far as we can see. And then this idea of kind of what we do with our field margins, so this is, most of that is phacelia, uh, which is quite late flowering in the season, it flowers for quite a long time. Uh, it is a phenomenal plant for uh, bees and butterflies and other pollinators, um, and that's one of the farmers, Jilly, admiring, admiring her field, and a rogue sunflower there, uh, poking up. And then it was also about leaving wilder spaces where we can. So this beautiful image of this big fat bumblebee on teasel, one of their favourite flowers. Uh, also, so this was funded by the Space for Nature project last autumn. We, I say we, Gemma actually, bless her, did all of the bagging up, I think. Uh, and we had um, somewhere in the region of 13 different uh, community groups who were given bulbs to plant, so early flowering spring bulbs. There were crocuses and grape hyacinth and chalidoxa, I think. Um, so this is, this is our local garden club. <laughs> These are my lovely friends. This is the beginning of our bee garden outside our village hall. Um, so there, it looks, it looks very different now, actually. Um, so in, in Marlborough, this was outside a new community pub so they were planting up all these lovely spring bulbs. Um, this was another community project uh, in Marlborough Town, the waterfront garden. And it was really important that we got children involved um, in this, and they absolutely loved it. And one of the things that I think is really important uh, um, about not just encouraging children to plant things, but to help them to understand why they are doing it. Basically what this child is doing here is planting breakfast for a queen. That's why we're planting uh, crocuses, particularly crocuses. Um, bumblebee queens hibernate, so the rest of their brood will, will die off and only the queens um, survive over the winter and they hibernate. And they come out in February and they're really hungry and they need food and they need it to be quite near them because obviously they've come out of hibernation. They're really, they're really tired and, and um, already exhausted. What's important is that those bumblebee queens are able to gather enough food 
to be able to start their first brood because that first brood is the one that will then help her to keep laying more eggs to keep the process going. If that first brood doesn't survive or doesn't get laid, basically, if the eggs don't get laid, then that's kind of the end of that line. So early forage for, uh, for hibernating bees, emerging hibernating bees, is really, really crucial. Um, and bees love crocuses so much that, you know, crocuses open in the daytime and then they close at night. And the bees love them so much that sometimes they stay inside and they sleep inside the flowers. It's kind of cool. Um, so when we are helping children to be involved in these things, it's important that they understand the connection with what they're doing and that they, are then, they then come back in the spring and they see those flowers and they wait patiently for the bumblebee queens to come. Um, so they see that whole process happen. I think that's really crucial. So that's all very heartwarming. <laughs> that's a, that's a five flowers. Okay. It's not enough, is it? Um, so we do need to quantify the scale of what needs to happen. And one way that that was done was with... This was a paper that was put out uh, in relation to, um, the, uh, it was a countryside stewardship scheme for farmers. They, they have to quantify what they can do so they can get paid for what they do. So how much flower-rich habitat is actually enough? And what this paper was trying to do was to quantify that with a bit of maths. Okay, so I'm going to share some maths with you now. All right, bear with. All right, here we are. There. Ta-da! <laughs> Okay, you got that? That is the formula, everybody. I'll explain what that means. So this is how many flowers, flower units, do we need per 100 hectares? All right, so bear with just for a second. PD is the pollen demand. How much pollen do we need? Okay. PB is pollen per bee. Now, we know this for some species. We know how much pollen they need to raise one larvae. Because right, it's been measured. So some of that information is known. So PB is pollen per bee. For some species, we know how many bees there are per nest, so how many larvae they are in a nest. So we multiply that by bees per nest. And then, for some species, we know how many nests we could expect in a given area. So this is the nest density. Right? So that gives us the pollen demand. Does that make sense? Okay. If we then take that number, pollen demand, and we divide it by pollen per flower... This also has been measured for about 137 wildflower species in nanograms or whatever it is, okay, pollen per flower. That gives us how many flowers we need per 100 hectares. Yes. I love maths. It's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. It's a little bit of a ballpark figure, okay, because um, it's somewhere between half a million and 18 million Ballpark, ballpark, okay. However, so it depends which species we look at, it's, it depends which flowers we, we examine, but a rough... It's a lot, people, it's a lot of flowers. But what that does, what this graph tells us is that we need them through this whole period, February to November, with this massive peak in the, in the summer months, so June, July, August. And we're starting to see that now. So if you looked in your garden maybe a month, six weeks ago, you, might have, you would have seen some bees. Now you, you're probably seeing quite a lot more, yeah, because those first broods are now actually starting to fly. Um, and so we, we need this massive peak. However, this bit is really crucial because we don't get the bees here for some of those species, the hibernating species, if they haven't got food here. They also can't safely hibernate with enough store on board if we haven't got late flowering flowers too. Okay? So that's kind of why we need all of that going on. So that's another graph. just shows you this big June, July, August peak. Um, but um, that's, that was kind of looking at six particular species. Okay. So... Where are we going? Well, we've gone to Swindon. Woohoo! And we've gone to Swindon with this wonderful woman, Gillis, who for the last, I don't know how many years, 40 years, has just been um, a, an ardent environmental campaigner. And she just grasped this idea of the bee roads and she is running with it. And Gillis does a, 
a, a radio show and podcasts and things and she's got this lovely bee suit that she made which is basically strips of yellow fun fur just round a black t-shirt and I did promise her that I would wear my t so one of the things that Glynis did uh, was to create a place in, in Penhill. It's one of the, like people say it's one of the more deprived areas of Swindon, but it is also one of the areas of Swindon that has the uh, strongest sense of community, actually. And she created this beautiful wildflower meadow. That wall there now has the B Roads logo painted on it. Um, and this meadow that was about to become this again this year... Sadly, a new recruit to the mowing team for Swindon Borough Council mowed it last weekend. It was heartbreaking. It didn't, it didn't look this, this good, actually, because wildflower meadows often don't two or three years in. You have to really maintain them. So um, this was really quite distressing. But Glynis rang the council, and they all know her, <laughs> and they don't want to upset Glynis, so they sent someone round. And that afternoon, he came round, he raked up the grass that had been left behind. Uh, there were some uh, new shrubs that had been uh, put in here. They're all going to be replaced. The whole area is going to be reseeded. So we're kind of, we're not quite pleased that this man mowed this wildflower meadow. But what might come out of it is actually that it ends up looking better than it might have done this summer. Um, through connection, because Glynis is really just a bit of a rottweiler when it comes to wildlife, actually. And she just engages everybody. See, this is good gym. Have, are people aware of this as a project? This is just brilliant. People who, who go running, go running and do a good thing, and then run home. So, so, they, so they pop on their lycra, and they go for a jog, and they, for this particular day, they went to the haven and they did some weeding and some planting and then they jogged home. Good gym. There's probably one in your area. Do connect. Um, it's quite brilliant. And then, of course, then Glynis had a, a, a radio show called The Birds and the Bees. So she would interview people and she'd talk about the project. So anything that we can do to raise awareness, to include people, to get people excited about it, to get people learning about bees... To get people falling in love with insects, actually, because we care for the things we f that we love, and insects have been kind of out there as Ew, creepy crawlies, and, and we need to befriend them, and we need to love them, and then we will take care of them. Um, there's a brilliant project called The Secret Garden down in Salisbury, run by uh, a lady called Becky Twig. What a fantastic name for someone... <laughs> who's running a community garden. Uh, and this is award-winning. It's one of the top 10 bee gardens in the country. If you ever get a chance to go down to Salisbury, um, please do look this up. They have open days. Sundays kind of in, in the summer, I think, they're mainly open days on Sundays. But it is absolutely idyllic. It's, it's a beautiful, beautiful place. And there are lots of signs and things you can learn about bees. It encourages you to look for different species. And... Becky also started a thing called the Salisbury Bee Trail. Uh, so this was some really lovely, lovely artworks. Uh, Twelve little plaques that are dotted around the, the city. You can go for a walk. Each of these plaques has a different sort of bee on it. Um, so we can learn about these species that we know very little about. Uh, I think she now has funding to take this to other places, to other, other cities around the country. And they just do loads of learning. She just sends out loads of information. So... It's a, it's a model for what a good community bee garden should look like, really. Um, it is, of course, all about the bees. So this is, this is the... Yeah, this was... Um, where are you? Oh, you're over there, aren't you? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, I, so I've talked to the beekeepers in Melksham. So I'm, I'm hoping that there will be another little hub there in Melksham. Um, and then there we are, so they're better than Salisbury. Um, so if we just do a few of these things, we just... Just fill up <coughs> Wiltshire, really, and beyond to Berkshire, and there we are. Petals become flowers, become fields. And we want to join up with, so this is Bug Life. Have people heard of Bug Life? This is a national charity uh, supporting bugs, basically. And they have a national project called 
bee lines, bee lines. So these areas, they're quite, quite fat on the map, um, but this is what they want to join up, big scale. They want to join up corridors um, across the country for wildlife. Now, interestingly, there's a big gap in the middle of their map, and that gap is Wiltshire. So, so I contacted them and said, um, they've got mapping software on their website to map progress for their project. So I've asked them if we can map what we're doing on the B roads on their site, and they have essentially said yes, and they've just employed someone to look at Wiltshire for their national project. So, uh, so hopefully we could be instrumental in joining up these two bits of a national project, which will be really exciting. Um, so there is, there is, as I said in the beginning, there is a national pollinator strategy. And the beginning of the year, there was also, it didn't pass, but somebody, um, an MP called Ben Bradley, had put forward the idea of a pollinator protection bill. Strategies are kind of voluntary. Not much happens if you don't follow them, actually. There's, you know, there, there aren't consequences for that. But if you have a bill, if you have legislation that says we have a duty a duty to join things up, then that's a different kettle of fish altogether. So this is what he was asking for. He wasn't successful this time, but I think it will happen. I think there will come a time when there will be a duty to do this. We can't do otherwise. Um, but this, you know, at least there is something out there. Uh, and this, this is what the pollinator strategy wanted people to do, basically. Um, and I think that what we're doing with the B roads is is starting to address that. So more, bigger, better, joined up, diverse and high quality flower rich habitats, including nesting places and shelter and water actually. Um, healthy bees and other pollinators that are more resilient to climate change and severe weather effects. No further extinctions of known threatened pollinator species. So halting that process. And then enhanced awareness across a wide range of businesses, other organisations of the public, of the essential needs of pollinators. So these are, this is what the pollinator strategy wanted to do. And I think that the B roads, hopefully, is a model that can start to address that. Um, so evidence of these actions taken to support pollinators. There are loads of national things. So plant life, um, wild, wildflower, uh, um, charity now have someone specifically on their team looking at road verges, who's approaching local councils, people who are responsible for uh, managing road verges, to manage them differently, and they have a really good um, uh, manifesto, if you like, about how to do that. So we can tap into that. We can take that kind of information to our own local councils, whether they're parish or town um, or county. Uh, the Friends of the Earth have a huge resource backing their bee calls, uh, you know, so we, we can tap into all of these things. There's, there's a lot of resource sitting there. I know, um, Sally, you've got a lot of stuff from the uh, Bumblebee Conservation Trust. They've got a great thing on their website where you can basically uh, put in all the plants that are in your garden and it will give you a score about how bee-friendly you are. And it's quite competitive because if other people in your area have also done this, you can see how well you're doing compared to your neighbours. So if you're a bit competitive... I don't, I'm not very competitive, but if it helps the bees, you know, um, it will give you some um, ideas about other plants to put in and tell you how well you're doing. I talked a bit about the, um, the citizen science thing. Uh, so this bee, bee wars, I don't, I don't know, that sounds a bit odd, but anyway, Bees, Wasps and Ants Recording Society. Brilliant. So if you... If you start to learn a bit about the bees that you're seeing, you can contact these people and tell them what you've seen where. And this is one of the ways that we add to uh, national data sets, which is really important. And there's also a thing called the UK Pollinator Monitoring Scheme. Loads and loads of information um, on there. Um, on their website about how you can... It's simple stuff. You don't have to know all 250 species of bees. Okay? You just need to be able to say, is it a honeybee? Is it a bumblebee? Is it a different sort of bee? Is it not a bee? All right. <laughs> and recognise some flowers, watch them for 10 minutes, monitor, write down what you see. Okay? It's pretty simple stuff. We can teach this to children. And this really helps to uh, create those data sets that we, that we need uh, to know where we are and where we're going and whether we're making progress. 
Um, so I'm thinking that, yeah, and well, uh, having a cup of tea um, in a moment, and then hopefully some of you will stay behind for a bit of a chat about where's the opportunity for you here, uh, what could you do um, in this area. Uh, we do have a Facebook uh, group, uh, Facebook um, page. I think I'm going to make it into a group. It'll be a bit more um, communal then, uh, called The B Road, um, or The B Roads, and... So, yeah, that, my, my parting thought to you. Petals <coughs> become flowers, become fields, become landscapes, and that's the level that we need to be changing things for bees and pollinators. That is it. I'm done. <laughs>